books from these authors. And it'll send you to bookshop.org, which is where we try to link uh, our book sales through because bookshop.org helps independent booksellers and gives a portion of their proceeds back to independent booksellers. Um, I also want to say thank you to anyone who has donated. Um, you know, there is a free ticket option and a donate option. Um, I just want to say thank you because those contributions um, help offset the costs of the, the platform, platform, the Crowdcast platform. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to bring our panelists on. And I'm going to shrink myself here left of stage. <laughs> Uh, so Alina, why don't you, if you could start off for us, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your book, and if you could read a short excerpt from your new novel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I am Alina Adams. I am the author of My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish Autonomous Region. What was the Jewish Autonomous Region? It was the first independent Jewish state of the 20th century, predating Israel by about 20 years, established on the border between Russia and China by that great friend of the Jews, Joseph Stalin. I was born in Odessa, then the USSR, now the Ukraine, and I moved to the United States with my family. My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish Autonomous Region, is my second historical fiction. I've previously written Regency romances, contemporary romances, uh, figure skating mystery series, and tie-ins to two soap operas as the world turns and guiding light. I will now read to you an excerpt from My Mother's Secret, the book that also matches the book that's right behind Colin's shoulder. So it's an incredible coincidence. Chapter one, Moscow, USSR. She had her ticket. All that was necessary now was to get on the train. Regina glanced over her shoulder. Yaroslavsky railway station was as bustling as ever. Men in gray suits and ties, patched jackets and caps with brims that flopped over their eyes, jostled women wearing wool coats trimmed with rabbit fur, some with kerchiefs over their heads, others sporting more fashionable berets. All rushed to board trains for Vladivostok, Kirov, Tomsk, and a host of other Eastern destinations. No one had any reason to pay attention to an 18-year-old girl struggling to drag a scuffed leather bag she'd thrown together a few hours earlier, blindly tossing in random items in Regina's haste to be gone before the black wooded militaire summoned for Sorry, before the black wooded mills, this is me switching between Russian and English. Russian is my first language. English is my writing language. The black wooded militaires returned for her. They might only want to ask her questions about people she knew, people who'd already been arrested. They might arrest and then release her if she provided them with the answers they were seeking, or they might put her on trial, the kind of trial where an innocent verdict wasn't an option. If Regina were braver, she might have struck around to find out. If Regina were braver, she might have stuck around to defend her friends who she knew had done nothing wrong, same as her. If Regina were braver, she wouldn't currently be at the train station, glancing furtively over her shoulder. She had her ticket. What she didn't have was permission to leave or settle elsewhere. Soviet citizens were the freest in the world. Maintaining this freedom necessitated their leaders knowing where each was at all times. This led to stability, the seedbed of liberty. Those were uh, There were over two dozen scheduled stops between Moscow and Regina's destination in the Far East. At any of them, the conductor could demand to review her propiska. If she failed to provide one, he had every right to yank her off his train and deposit Regina in the care of local authorities, who would promptly, likely under armed guard, return her to Moscow, where Regina's attempt to run would buy her, bury her into deeper trouble. The proper course of action for those who wish to relocate to Biravijan, the newly formed Jewish Autonomous Region, JAR, between the Bira and Bijan rivers of the Russian-Chinese border, was to register a request with Komzet, the Committee for the Settlement of Jewish Toilers on the Land. Komzet would authorize the appropriate travel documents. They might also bring her name to the attention of the authorities. She couldn't risk that, not until everything blew over, which it would have to sooner or later. Regina hadn't done anything wrong. It wasn't her fault she'd failed to realize it until it was too late that those around her might have. If only she could make it to Baravijan. Comrade Kaminsky, head of the village Soviet, would surely vouch for her loyalty to the state. They'd always had a good rapport whenever he'd visited Moscow. Regina had listened enthralled to his tales of Baravijan, its rich farmland, its plump livestock, the trees full of fruit and the rivers full of fish. As Comrade Stalin had pronounced one month earlier, 
For the first time in the history of the Jewish people, its burning desire for a homeland, for the achievement of its own national statehood has been fulfilled. It was one of the many reasons why all Soviet children dressed in school uniforms of brown dresses with black pinafores for every day, white ones for special occasions for girls or brown pants, with white shirts for boys and crimson scarves for all, began their day by reciting, thank you, great comrade Stalin, for our joyous childhood. Comzet flourished under the oversight of Lazar Kaganovich, Secretary of the Central Committee, Commissar of the Communications, the most powerful Jew in the Soviet Union. The nationality of the Jew is the nationality of the merchant, he quoted Karl Marx when establishing the JAR. Emancipation from huckstering and money will be the self-emancipation of our time. Regina had always intended to go there. She'd always intended to be part of the pioneer movement to build the independent, thriving Jewish socialist state where Yiddish literature was taught in schools, Yiddish plays were performed in theaters, Yiddish newspapers educated the public, and Yiddish speakers could walk streets marked with Yiddish signs safe from violent attacks. Regina might not have spoken Yiddish herself, but she was enthralled with the notion of a place where others could. At the close of the Great October Revolution, Jews, like all worthy Soviet citizens, had been accorded their own plots of land to work. Unfortunately, the previous owners, Kulaks, Comrade Stalin needed to show the error of their ways a decade earlier, weren't happy with the redistribution. Thus, it was determined that in the interest of keeping anti-Semitic violence to acceptable levels, the optimal course of action was to convince Jews living in the USSR and its surrounding territories to relocate to the farthest eastern point of the, on, the <clears throat> on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, where they would be safe, out of the way, and no longer annoying their neighbors. It's the only solution there is, I guess. Uh, thank you, Alina. Um, just to, to brag, because I know you probably won't, um, Alina's book came out yesterday, and it was number one in the Kindle store for Jewish um, literature and fiction and, and historical Russian fiction. So congratulations. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, Tessa, let's go to you if you could introduce yourself, your book, and read a short excerpt for us. Thanks, Colin. I'm Tessa Afshar, and I write historical fiction set in biblical times, both Hebrew Bible and New Testament. My newest book just came out last week. It's called The Hidden Prince, and it's uh, based on a Jewish captive girl uh, in Babylon. It starts in Babylon, and she works in the household of Daniel. So what I'm about to read, actually, I was born in the Middle East, so um, some of my impressions are memories of my own life there. So I, I relate to Alina having this double life, so to speak. So I'm about to start where uh, the main character, Karen, meets her new uh, mistress. The door swung open behind us, and the most elegant woman I had ever seen entered on sandaled feet. Her long, royal blue tunic danced at her ankles as she walked deeper into the room to stand next to Daniel. Two pale blue shawls decorated with the golden fringe so admired by Babylonians draped diagonally across one shoulder, held in place by a jeweled belt. Someone had arranged her hair into perfect, ornamented creation of loops and crimps adorned by gold rings. But by far the most glamorous thing about her was her face. With its sharp, short nose, cool brown eyes darkened with coal, and curved lips that dip, dipped into a deep wedge at the center. Those lips betrayed no expression when Lord Daniel introduced me. Mahlo, my dear, Daniel said with a smile. Here is your new charge, Karen. I'm sure you will find some useful task for her around the house. This, then, was my mistress. I would not be spending my time serving Lord Daniel in his study, it seemed. I hid my disappointment and bowed respectfully before the elegant woman. My new mistress regarded me in silence. If she were a scroll, I was illiterate. I could read nothing from her expression, which remained bland as she scrutinized me. Let us try the kitchens, she said. My heart sank. This might not be an auspicious beginning. My mother and sisters rarely allowed me near the place. Excellent idea, Daniel said. 
immediately returning to his pile of clay tablets. And I barely had time for a hurried goodbye embrace from my father before Lady, Lady Mahla led me out of the chamber. My husband tells me you're 14, the mistress said. as She guided me through the corridor into the rectangular courtyard. Above us, a partial roof of palm wood planks and packed earth kept the climbing sun at bay. Yes, mistress, I'm tall for, a, for my age, and the rest of me still has to catch up. The elegant face remained impassive, but I fancied I saw the tiniest sparkle in the brown eyes as she turned to study me for a moment. The kitchen is here, was all she said, leading me to a chamber in the far corner of the courtyard. A rotund man with dark hair stood by the open door, sharpening his knife. He bowed when he spied the mistress. I kept an eye on him, worried he might poke his flesh on the point of his blade as he bent down. He proved dexterous, however, portly fingers nimbly tucking the knife away. My lady, how may I be of service? I have brought you additional help, Manasseh. This is Karen. See if you can train her to be useful around the kitchen. Yes, lady. He bowed again, not straightening until the mistress began to walk away. I followed his example, though it seemed excessive. If I had to bow every time someone above my station came and went, I would spend the whole day bent over my shoes. Thank you, Tessa. I love those descriptions are just so beautiful. I want to apologize. Um, Dora did, Dora Levy, Mason and she she's here she's somewhere I'm trying to get her on stage um, so Dora if you can hear me um, I'm sending you an invitation to join us on stage hopefully you'll be able to accept that and, and join us here on camera uh, for now I'm going to bring in Richard who I recorded his interview earlier um, and I asked you know so Richard Zimler the author of the incandescent threads and I'm going to play his little uh, reading here. My name is Richard Zimler. Um, I'm American and I'm Portuguese. I've lived in Portugal for the last 32 years, and although I'm originally from New York, and um, and I'm a novelist. Uh, that's pretty much all I do. And my latest book, uh, The Incandescent Threads, so you can see it here, has just come out in America. Came out in England a little before that. It's um, about two wonderful, charismatic, a bit eccentric cousins who grew up in Warsaw in Poland and who are caught up in World War II. Uh, their families are killed in the Holocaust and they're the only survivors. There's Shelley and Benny. Both of them are Zarkos, that's their family name. Shelley is 10 years older than Benny, so he considers himself Benny's older brother. And the book isn't about the death camps or that period so much as their lives after, their, after the war, how they remake their lives in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, etc. Uh, they get married, they have kids, Benny becomes a tailor in New York, and Shelley owns a sporting goods store in Montreal. And, and I'm going to start with a brief excerpt um, that's narrated by Eva a Polish piano teacher. She saves Benny during the war. He's a little boy, 11 years old, and she makes the difficult decision to hide him in her home, which of course could have resulted in her own arrest and death. And while Benny is in her home, they're denounced and they're not sure by whom. So later, Eva writes this, and it's about a discovery she makes about the importance of hiding Benny. Six months after our return, I crossed paths with Felix for the first time at the main market in Brigini. Curiously, I wasn't, attempted, I wasn't tempted to question him about what he'd done because I'd learned by then that the Poles who'd collaborated with the Nazis all found good and noble reasons to betray the Jews and those of us who had hidden them. Just as the Poles who stood by while their Jewish neighbors were arrested, put in ghettos, and turned to ash, I'd found any number of justifications for their silence. If a former student of mine had not brought me Benny, and if I'd refused to take him in, then I too would have likely been guilty of the same unforgivable crime. The boy saved my life in that sense and permitted me to go on composing 
and teaching little children how to play Mozart and Beethoven, though I realized soon enough, seeing clearly where duplicity and silence had brought my country, that I ought to have done much more to fight the Nazis from the very start. All right, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, I had a really nice conversation with him on Monday, and um, I'm looking forward to sharing more of, of that conversation later. But uh, next, let's so go back to Alina. Uh, Alina, this is a blog post you shared on our, our website the other day about you write so many different genres, and I'm just curious, um, what do you like about writing historical fiction as compared to other genres that you write in? Okay, go ahead. Um, so here's the thing. It, it actually, it's the sword that cuts both ways with writing historical fiction, is that on the one hand, it's more difficult because you actually have to be loyal to history. You can't suddenly put an event that didn't happen 30 years before the fact or 30 years after the fact. History won't look at you too kindly. But on the other hand, there's the benefit that history gives you a story. People always say, how do you come up with your ideas? How do you come up with stories? Well, no, history did that. All I did was I came up with characters who reacted to the events that happened. So you don't necessarily have to come up with things that happen. You have to decide which of the parts of history your character is going to interact with. But that part is done for you. I even talk about letting history be your co-writer because that's what it is. History comes up with the situation and you come up with the characters who then deal with those situations. Uh, really good point. And, and I'll just have to admit that um, I've, I've written several novels and I've only written historical fiction. I don't even know if I could go outside of the genre because like you said, history does have to work for you. Uh, well, let's go back to, oops. Oh, looks like we're getting Dora. Oh. Dora, um, I, yes. can, I can hear you, so that's good. That's great. I can't see you, but uh, we'll, we'll It's a miracle. Out. I'm going crazy, <laughs> but I don't know what to do, so you see me, too. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm glad that you could at least join us with, with your voice, and I, I did. So before the event started, I got on a Google Meet with Dora, and she has the most wonderful setup with all her books in the background. She was dressed to the nine, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that we weren't quite able to figure that out but i'm glad you're here um so dora if you don't mind why don't you tell us about yourself and, and your book all right i will i'm heartbroken you can't see i can but i can see you uh so i was born in israel i was nine years old when my parents and uh, moved to iran because my our family was there since Cyrus the Great, 2,500 years ago. I uh, spent formative years of my life in Iran. And then during the Islamic uh, Revolution of 1979, uh, basically we had to flee Iran uh, because as you probably know or don't, Jews were not welcome anymore. So. We settled in Los Angeles and I went back to school, uh, got my degree in English literature and my master's in professional writer and became a historical novelist. So um, that is my story. Now my book, Love and War in the Jewish Quarter, actually takes place in um, Iran in 1941 through 1944 against the backdrop of World War II, uh, which is not very well known to the Western world how instrumental Iran was in the transport of war material to the Soviet Union in order to fight Hitler and in the war against, um, and in winning the war. Uh, so this is basically just a bit about my book. If uh, I have time, I'd love to read just a page because it would give you a good idea of what the book is about. Yeah, yeah, please do. May I? All right. <clears throat> so this is Tehran, 1941. 
Pride and fear travel fast in the Jewish quarter, where everyone's nose is in someone else's business, and gossip gets trapped in the low-roofed shacks and blind alleys. Dr. Suleiman Yaron is on his way to see Her Majesty, Queen Fauzia Pahlavi. Men with skull caps on their heads and prayers on their lips, ululating women with festive clothes and colorful scarves, bankers and merchants, butchers and fruit vendors, the Shah's waterman and the quarter fool, the rabbis and the quarter whore with her bleached hair and rhinestone studded slippers are out to wish their beloved doctor a safe journey and a safe return. Suleiman guides his restless stallion towards the alley of seven synagogues, where his father stoop, stoops out of the door of his house. Suleiman leans from the saddle to give his father's shoulder an affectionate squeeze. I will be back before nightfall, Baba. Better off, I hope. Unable to afford a house, you'd walk out of with your back straight and proud. Bowing to Goim is the least of my worries, son. Elazar, the redhead's unruffled voice, defies the constellation of blazing freckles sprinkling his pallid face. Having been accosted in alleys and under bridges, spat on and bitten, his head shaved with rusty razors, he no longer frets over the outdated edict, requiring low doors on Jewish homes, so that the occupants genuflate like servants when they step out. He slips a small Tehillim prayer book into the pocket of Suleiman's coat. Bottle up your pride, son. Keep your eyes open and your mouth shut at all times, or you will end up hanging from a tree in a deserted alley. Don't forget that even if you become the queen's dentist, to them, you are still an adjust impure Jew. So that is my reading. I am so sorry. I can't see your lovely faces. I'm happy. That I, you know, I see you smiling. I'm wonderful. And I'm just heartbroken. All right. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, technical stuff like that happens. But yeah, we're so glad uh, we could hear you read that. That was that was beautiful. And, and you know, you, you bring up a, a really good point about what historical fiction does. And that's, you know, share these these little nooks and crannies of history that we wouldn't otherwise know about. And just hearing you read that, I think, is was wonderful. And I had to write down what you said, constellations of blazing freckles. I thought that was just beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Tessa, let's go to you. Um, I wonder if you could talk about your main character, Karen. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and I, I'm, I'm also curious about how you write biblical fiction and, and how her that character fits into the this genre of biblical fiction. I prefer to call it uh, historical fiction written or set in the time of the Bible, just because Bible and fiction sort of seem to not sure. go together quite well. But uh, so Karen is a fictional character. She's a servant in the household of Daniel. She ends up uh, working as a scribe uh, part of the time and then going to the tablet house, which is like a homeschooling back then in in the time of uh, sort of the great age of Babylonia. And so she's going to school with Daniel's uh, sons and their friend, and she's growing up with boys. So she learns a little bit of sword craft and archery and things like that as well. But uh, just as things are going smoothly, she, uh, due to a very tragic accident, she has to run away from Babylon. And when she feels like her life is over, where she feels like there's no hope for her future, she discovers actually that she is given a very mysterious task, which is to teach a shepherd boy how to be a lord. And uh, in time finds out that far from not having a future, uh, Providence has entrusted her with a very important task, 
which is saving the life of a boy who might grow up to save her people from captivity. So um, that that's that's sort of the main structure of the novel. Can't hear you, Colin. Um, do you find writing this uh, historical fiction from the Bible, uh, do you feel like you're kind of hemmed in, uh, your creativity is a little bit, or or do you feel it kind of freeing that you get to expand on what what's available? I thought Alina did such a beautiful job earlier when she was talking about uh, writing historical novels in general. And I think a lot of that also applies to writing fiction set in the Bible. Um, one of two things, I mean, first of all, I have to honor history as well. And I, on top of that, I have to be very mindful of the story that is in the context of the Bible itself. And to me, that's fantastic. It's a privilege because the Bible remains one of the most fascinating, fascinating books of literature in the world. It's a wellspring of human emotion, of wisdom. It's a very honest book. And like uh, by that, I mean, it doesn't try to hide anything or smooth anything out. You, um, you have people who are murderers, adulterers, cowards, and, and those are the good guys, you know? Those are the guys that you're rooting for. So it, it gives you a, a, a real sense of, hey, there's hope for me. And uh, I like I'm in this. I can find myself in this book. Even if I'm not a murderer, I can certainly uh, connect with the people who are imperfect and they are struggling to find their way. So, uh, so in that sense, it's a treasure trove for me as a foundation for these stories. But on another level, uh, I know that for many of us, it's also a sacred book. And so I, I need to be very careful to remain within those guidelines that are important for me and my readers. Uh, so, yeah, you know, uh, I, I think the good far outweighs the, the difficulties. But yeah, there, there is definitely a, a framework to which I have to stick. Well, it sounds like quite a, a difficult challenge but yeah i i really appreciate the way you put that and gave you know gave us some insight into how how you do that you know for those of us who don't write that genre well i'm going to bring in uh richard again i asked him about his main characters uh benny and shelly and i wanted to know about his he, he told their story in a non-linear format so i asked him to talk more about that Yeah, so after the war, Benny and Shelley managed the, to make their way to Canada. Um, and eventually, uh, Belly, uh, Benny, excuse me, goes to New York and becomes a tailor. Now, I wrote, I wanted to write the first chapter about a, a trauma in Benny's life. After the war, his wife, his beloved wife, Teresa, dies. She's a musician, a flute player. And Benny pretty much gives up on life. He decides not to leave his house. He doesn't take in the mail. The only phone calls he answers are from his son, Ethan. And we know he's in a terrible depression and crisis. And Ethan comes down from Boston to New York to help him. And so I wrote this chapter from Ethan, his son's point of view. And I think it's a very emotional wonderful chapter about the relationship, this, such a close and often difficult relationship between the two of them. But after I was finished, I realized I had nothing more to say about Ethan and Benny and that particular crisis. And so I was wondering, well, where does the rest of the novel go? Happily, Ethan, in his narrative, mentioned many other wonderful and intriguing and mysterious people. He mentioned Shelley, of course, Benny's older cousin. He mentioned his mother. He mentions his aunt, Julie, who's married to Shelley. He mentions George, their best friend, a Navajo Indian who helped save Benny after the war. So there's a series of characters that he mentions. And I, and I thought, well, I'm going to write the rest of the book to discover who these people are and how Benny and Shelley have influenced them. And so I decided to write it from their point of view. And that's what makes the book, in my opinion, kind of a mosaic that the reader has to, in part, put together. Um, so there's a, a, a chapter, for instance, from Teresa, Benny's wife, about how they met, 
and fell in love and the difficulties during the early years of their marriage, in part because of Benny's trauma and his unwillingness to talk about losing his family during the Holocaust. There's a chapter from Julie, Shelley's wife, and the difficulty she goes through because Shelley is a very sexual person. He, he decides that he's going to live his life to the fullest. That's how he deals with his trauma. So Julie talks about the difficulties in their marriage. And then there's a chapter from Eva, the woman who saves Benny during the war, this beautiful, wonderful Christian piano teacher. And there's a chapter from George, who's their best friend, a Navajo Indian, and how he manages to locate Benny after World War II back in Poland. So it's a mosaic that I like a lot because slowly over the course of 350 pages, the reader begins to see how these two wonderful charismatic coven, cousins have had such a dramatic. Okay. Yeah. I, I got the impression that Richard really enjoys storytelling. He, and I know he told me that he, he always starts with just, just a little bit of an idea and then he lets the characters kind of take over and tell the story. Just like he said that, you know, he only had so much to go off of and he had to kind of meet these other people in order to, to tell this story. Well, I'm going to go back to Alina before I do. I want to remind people that we do have a Q&A feature. If you're interested in asking um, any of our panelists a question, just click on the question mark on the right side of your screen and you can type that question in and I will ask our panelists. Uh, Alina, I've gotten to know you a little bit and uh, I, you are... A, a prolific writer you have 18 books now and in multiple different genres and then you know you've worked in tv and done many other things what i would like you to share is all the work that ins that's involved in being a writer because it's a lot more than just sitting down and writing the book that might be 15 percent of it so what else is is involved and and how important is that to to help you reach your readers well, I like to say that it's a third. Writing is actually a third of being a writer. The first third is trying to find someone who will let you write for them, whether it's books, whether it's articles, whether it's um, profiles, whether it's blog posts. So a third of writing is looking for writing work. A third of writing is writing. And a third of writing is trying to get paid for having written. But, and that includes not just sending many invoices, which is sometimes part of it, but also marketing. The fact of the matter is these days, I talk to a lot of aspiring writers and I tell them writing is just a third of what being a writer is. You have to do your marketing. And it's not as simple as back in the day when you put out a press release and you sent it to every local publication and every niche publication in your genre and then sat back and called it a day. There are blogs, there are podcasts, there are review sites, there is social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I haven't gotten to TikTok yet. My daughter, who's 15 years old, tells me she gets all of her book recommendations off of TikTok. Book talk is apparently huge. That's wonderful. It's on my to-do list. I'm going to get to that. Um, Twitter apparently is falling apart right now, so maybe I'll have to uh, do a little substitute. But to answer your question, my numbers are it's a third that writing, actually sitting down and writing your book, your article, your op-ed is just a third of it. And the rest of the time is trying to get people to read it, which is a big part of getting paid for it. And is that just a, a ratio you've come to accept or is it a ratio that you've actually come to enjoy a little bit? I mean, I will admit that I enjoy the marketing piece of it because I actually genuinely enjoy talking to readers. I enjoy the interactive aspect of social media. I also have kind of turned it into a game in the sense of if I sent out 20 queries today, how many positive responses am I going to get back? So I've turned it into a, a sort of a, a, a slot machine to see, you know, so I've got the endorphin kick of whether the three cherries are going to line up. But that said, if I could throw it all away tomorrow and just sit and write and continue to get the kind of results that I do, I would stop 
all of the marketing efforts and all of the social media and just focus on writers. Cause I actually think I have a problem in the sense that I'm addicted to writing. I'm addicted to the physical process of writing. When I sit down and start clicking the keys, I'm like, you know, the monkeys who would get endorphin hits into their brains every time they hit a button. So I do think I have a little problem there. I love writing, you know, Dorothy Parker has the quote where she doesn't like writing. She likes having had written. I actually genuinely enjoy writing. So if I could get rid of everything else and just write, I would. But since that's not an option, I have decided that I enjoy marketing as well. Yeah, yeah, it's too bad that you, you can't just do, do the part that you love all the time. But, you know, that's part of part of the job. Well, let's go back to Dora. Um, Dora, you, you brought this up in your reading about some of the challenges Jews faced in Iran at that time, but can you can you be a little bit more specific and tell us about what what led Jews to settle there uh, during World War II and and what were they up against as, and and also what was your character Dr. Solomon up against? Dora, can you hear me? Dora, are you there? I feel like that's her that we can hear. Well, let's go back to Tessa then um, for a moment. Um, well, and I had a question here for you about, but it looks like you, you've already covered it. So I'm going to move on to another question. Um, can you talk about how your conversion to Christianity in your 20s affected your career? Um, maybe talk about is it is is it is that something that pushed you into writing or you know which came first kind of the chicken or the egg is what i'm asking as far as your conversion and then then the writing or the writing and then the conversion can you just talk about that i feel like this question is a little bit um more more uh, self revelatory more personal uh, everybody else has been able to kind of stick to their writing. So forgive me as I go a little bit deeper. Uh, to answer the last part of that question, yeah, I feel like I really was made to write. I, since I was a child, I was an avid reader and an avid writer. And when I was a kid, like my friends used to um, ask me to write their essays for them for school, at, even in grade school, because I could like during recess write a quick story and they could get a good grade so um and i wanted to be a before my conversion my my big desire was to be a romance novelist so i actually wrote two serial romances one of them came very close to being published but uh ultimately they actually wrote me an apology letter that said um uh, we're really sorry uh we couldn't make our minds up like the pub board was divided and so we decided not to take it in the end, but could you please send us the next thing that you have? And what that process revealed was that I had this really fragile part of my soul that was just super sensitive to rejection. I was very afraid of failure. So after that, uh, I, I didn't write for a long time because I would start to write partially and then I would hear those words of this is, you know, we decided to pass on this. And I'd be like, oh, they're going to pass on this too. This is just not good enough. This is not good. Nobody's going to want to read this. So I would leave everything unfinished and go forward. So um, the first way my conversion affected uh, my writing was the fact that it gave me the healing I needed in that fragile, broken place to be able to write and finish a book, actually. So the first book that I wrote after that uh, process, it took a long time because that healing process took a long time. But that first book went on to be published and was translated into several languages. And uh, so, I, so I, I just needed to get to that place. Uh, the second portion of it was I didn't end up being a romance novelist. I still love romance. So they, uh, most of my books have a thread of romance in them. I think we all have that. But they're not romance novels in the sense that my my key question for for most of my stories now is really that 
addressing that broken place in all of us, the, the, the places where we wonder, where is my worth coming from? Is my worth in what I do? Um, so the answer of real romance novels is you find your worth in the fact that someone worthy loves you and that reflects on you. But we all know that that's actually not the case. So my, my stories are a search for uh, sort of like revealing the lie that you have believed and then finding the response to that lie. And like the, the turning point is when the hero or the heroine recognize who they really are, what their worth is really about. I, I, I joke and I say, essentially all my stories are the ugly duckling story told again, again, and again, and again, because I think most of us in, in some corner of our souls feel like an ugly duckling. And we need to get to the reality that no, you're you're the swan. You're the swan. You know, you're the you're the beauty, just as you are. Uh, you need healing. You need restoration. You need redeeming. But you're the swan. So, um, so I, I would say, yeah, that 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 my faith journey has definitely impacted my writing. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's a really beautiful message. Uh, so what do you have some advice for writers facing rejection? I mean, Alina said she turns it into a game. What 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 do you do about it? I I think rejection is part of life and if you're getting to a place where a shallow rejection is breaking you, then the best thing you can do for yourself is understand don't get your writing better. I mean, that's always good but also get your soul better. Like, why are you so easily overcome by rejection? We all get a little bit depressed by it, or, you know, we, we have a couple of bad days, but, you know, one sunny day and you ought to get over it and get on to the next project. And if you can't, if you can't, uh, you know, fall seven times and get up again, you have to examine where did that brokenness come in? Where, where did you believe a lie about yourself? So restore your soul. Your soul is worth a lot more than a novel. I need, I need a bumper sticker that says that. <laughs> well, I'm going to check with Dora. Dora, are you there? Can you hear us? Can, you, can we hear you? She seems to be on mute. The graphic at the bottom shows that she's on yeah, mute. Yeah, well, that, that was interesting is the first time she spoke, she was on mute then as well. And I, I, I don't know how she did it, <laughs> <laughs> but she did. Okay, well, we'll, we'll move on to Richard. So I asked Rich, um, trauma is, generational trauma is a theme in his novel. So I asked him if he could speak a little bit more about that. So let me bring him back on here in just a second. There we go. A lot of children of Holocaust survivors discovered is that their parents who were in the camps or in the ghettos didn't want didn't want to discuss their experiences. They they kept them hidden. They kept them inside a great circle of silence. I remember I had a friend from university from college who told me her name was Julie that she always felt that her father didn't trust her enough because he would never speak about it. So this generational trauma sometimes got passed down to children and even grandchildren because of this huge amount of silence around the subject. Um, and in my book, what I tried to show is how Benny and Shelley each have different approaches to this, how they deal with it differently. For instance, just to give you an example, Benny refuses to show his love for Ethan, his son in public because he's so worried that this beautiful boy will be taken away from him if he reveals how much the kid means to him. And so the general tr generational trauma, even though the survivors of the Holocaust didn't, that was the last thing they wanted to do. The last thing they wanted to do was pass along their suffering. Unfortunately, in some cases that happened, although there were many different approaches. So, some of them talked about it all the time, which of course, brings up other problems of people dwelling on the difficulties and the cruelty and the anti-Semitism. So there's a whole range of generational trauma that goes into the lives of these Holocaust survivors. Yeah, another very important topic, and, and I'm glad Richard was able to, to talk about that. Uh, Lena, Alina, let's go back to you. Um, 
so you you brought this up that beer how do you say it again Biravijan. Biravijan. <laughs> it, 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 i mean and we've, we've seen this in the reviews it's just no one has heard about it and you know i uh, i studied history in college i work in a high school where i teach history and i it doesn't ever come up anywhere well, why why do you think that is well, it's interesting. I gave a talk this Monday at um, a Jewish group, a Russian speaking Jewish group in the greater Washington, D.C. area. And one of the women who is also a teacher, she said the most interesting thing. She said in America, and I think um, some of the other writers will be able to relate to this in America, Jewish history, especially European Jewish history, stops in 1948. Basically, you cover World War II, then you get to the state of Israel, and after that, Jewish history pretty much screeches to a halt. There is an entire gap about the fact that there are Jews in Iran. There are Jews in Egypt. Sassoon, as in Vidal Sassoon, is one of the oldest uh, Jewish names in Egypt. There are Jews in China. There are Jews everywhere. And yes, there were Jews in the 1930s and 40s in Europe who were not part of as much of the Holocaust and all of the issues that we actually just heard about, but that they were in the Soviet Union having their own trauma and their own issues. It's like, uh, well, obviously you can't cover all history, even in 13 years of school and then maybe eight years of college if you go to graduate school, you can't cover all history. But even Jews who think they know Jewish history, it stops at 1948 and all Jewish history of the 20th century was in Western Europe. Well, how about, how about yourself? Uh... Um, when did you first learn about it and decide that that you wanted to write about it? Well, those are two different questions. When did I first learn about it? I heard inklings of it even when I lived in the Soviet Union and then I was raised in completely in a community of Soviet Jews. If I can actually just go back and refer to, to Richard's answer um, when he talked about generational trauma, I didn't know that was a word until my American born children taught it to me. I thought that was what we called life. I, I didn't, it was like air. What, what it, it needed a name. It needed a specification. That's just what it is. So I, I find this whole concept of it just really interesting. It would be like, so tell me, what was it like growing up breathing air is the equivalent of that question. But to get back to it. So I had heard inklings about it. Um, my parents had mentioned it. My grandparents had mentioned it. There was a big belief in the 1950s that right before Stalin died, he was actually planning to ship all the Jews of the Soviet Union, whether they wanted to go or not, to Birabajan. So that that rumor always lived and that fear always lived. But when I actually decided that I wanted to write about it is when I actually read a wonderful nonfiction book by Masha Gessen called Where the Jews Aren't, um, because they went into great detail about what life was there was like. And that's what, I remember what I said at the beginning, I don't need to come up with a story. History has come up with a story. I just need to put some characters in it. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm certainly glad you did do that, put some characters in it, um, because it's it's not just informative, but it's, you know, it's enjoyable to read, it's engaging, and um, yeah, I'm so glad that you put, that you did do that. Um, Dora, if you can hear us, just chime in anytime, if you can get your, your uh, microphone to work, just go ahead and chime in. Otherwise, let's go back to Tessa. Uh, Tessa, I, you... I want to talk more about uh, research, um, and you know, you did mention that although it's it's got a you know a biblical setting and a biblical message, you still ha it's still historical fiction. You still have to to do that historical research, and you know, I would call this ancient history. So, what what kind of research do you rely on in order to build your characters and share your setting? Thank you. That's a great question. Can I just say as an aside, Dora, we miss you so much. And you've got to come back and do this again, because I would love to see your beautiful face and, and your beautiful voice and your book sounded amazing. I just, ha I'm, I'm sure everybody who's listening feels the same way as I do. So it's, it's, um, it's really, a, uh, we're missing out on a lot. So in terms of uh, research, uh, well, I mean, I believe that my readers rely on me to tell a story that is as close to historically accurate as possible. 
while also telling them a big wallop of a lie, which is my novel. Uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the fiction that I am creating has to be ensconced in this framework of truth and reality as much as, po as possible. Of course, I also write um, ancient history and historians back then didn't understand history the way we do. And it's really filled in with legend. Uh, so you have the truth and you have reality and you have legend. And historians today are, uh, you know, filling up graduate schools, trying to, uh, to differentiate between all of these threads. For the hidden prince, for example, I used a lot of Herodotus and a few other uh, historical, a, a few other Greek historians who, again, uh, like the main story from Herodotus that I use in this, we believe a lot of it is legend. But to be honest, it was a lot better than whatever the truth was, because we don't know exactly what the truth was. So I stuck pretty closely to Herodotus's legend. And uh, obviously, there, there is no Karen in Herodotus's legend. There is no Jewish girl who is central to the story. But she, she, she becomes uh, my creation, my way of telling this story uh, she becomes a witness to it, and she becomes an uh, an interpreter of events uh, from from the perspective of providence. Like, was all of this happenstance? Did it just happen to fall into this you know, pattern? Uh, did it just come to be like that? Uh, is it coincidence, or was there some kind of a plan behind it? And uh, and but I I love that part of my job to do some historical research, but I'm not a historian. So I'm like that dangerous person who, and, and I really don't believe that someone who writes historical fiction can get all their facts from uh, going on Google. You can get some things online, but it just seems to me um, that you are doing your readers a disservice if that's where you stop. So I pour over books and I pour over secondary uh, sources as well. But at the end of the day, I'm not a historian. I'm a novelist. And uh, so, yeah, I'm not a theologian. I'm a novelist. So that's really like my self-defense. Uh, as soon as you open my book, you should know that. <laughs> well, you sound very genuine. And, and, and I trust that, yeah, you're doing the work that you need to do in order to tell these stories. Well, um, we're, uh, we're nearing the, the eight o'clock hour here in the central time zone. Um, so I want to wrap things up. I do want to remind people to uh, pick up these books. Just click on the, the link at the bottom. It says, get your book. And uh, that'll take you to bookshop.org. And you can, you can buy these, these books. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank our wonderful panelists. Um, I do have one more question for everyone. And I'm going to start off here with Richard. And I asked him about the value of historical fiction. So let's let's see what he has to say. I think it's extremely important because until the, let's say 1960s or 70, 70s of the last century, almost all history books were written from the point of view of the people who won the battles, who won the elections. The unofficial story was never told. You look at the American story of American slavery, for instance, very often that was just neglected. Um, and so historical novice can fill in the blanks. We can write about the people, the minorities um, who were taken out, excised from the official histories of their countries. That happened in Portugal when I discovered, for instance, the Lisbon massacre of 1506, when 2000 forcibly converted Jews were murdered and burnt in the main square. This was not taught in the Portuguese history books or school manuals. I discovered this. I made this an event that the Portuguese people know about. And so historical novelists can do that. We can challenge authority. We can challenge official history. We can write about people who are developmentally disabled, who are African-Americans, who are Jews living in Poland before the World War, before World War II. And so I think the last thing I want to say is, of course, in a subject like the Holocaust, it's really important to know the statistics that 6 million Jews died, 500,000 gypsies. 
but that doesn't convey an emotional reaction with the reader. If you want an emotional reaction, if you want to try to understand a little bit about what these persecuted Jews and gypsies, Roma, felt, you need to read Anne Frank. You need to read Primo Levi. You need to read wonderful historical novels. And that is where I hope my books come in. Really such a, a great statement there by, by Richard. And so Richard, thank you so much. I know you're not with us live, but I'm sure you'll be watching this later. So thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, for sharing all that and uh, for writing your the incandescent threads. Alina, um, I don't know if you if you can follow that. You've already talked a little bit about the importance of historical fiction and, and what it can reveal. Um, but what, what else do you think you can say about how important it is to to share history th through his through historical fiction or as one might say history through fiction it's, mm -hmm. it might be a pithy way to put it i actually want to jump right on to what richard says is um this quote has been attributed to everyone from stalin to hitler to himmler to goebbels but one death is a tragedy a million deaths is a statistic and that's actually very much in line with what richard was just saying and why i also think that historical fiction is important is that you can tell people that um, 15,000 people went to Birabajan and within a month, 12,000 of them came back because of the horrible living conditions, but that's just a number. It doesn't mean anything. If you tell the story of one person, then you can get a reaction. I always say that if you try to be universal, by telling everybody's story, you tell nobody's story. But if you tell one person's story, you tell everybody's story, which also goes back to a Jewish saying that he who has saved one life, it's as if he has saved the entire world. It's the same sort of thing with historical fiction. If you can tell the story of one life, you have told the story of a world. Yeah, and unfortunately there are so many tragedies throughout our world and, and it, it, yeah, you lose that emotional connection when it's just numbers, but to, you know, to put it in the form of a story in one person, I think that's really valuable. Uh, Tessa, so, so why do you write historical fiction? Why is it a worthy way to, to share history? About that. But I, I think just to add to that, there are certain things that when you live in a certain era, uh, pretty much the, the, um, the world is interested in one direction of the story. So when you when you think about, for example, the relationship of Iran and Israel right now, there's only one color to that. There's only one. There's only this wall of enmity. That that's how you picture it. So in my novel, I am bringing to life the reality that once Jews and Persians were very good friends, that Persia became great in in part because uh, some very brilliant Jewish people were working in the palace and were helping at the court and in the same but by, by the same token the captives were set free uh, thanks to the work of uh, an, a number of Persian kings and and how, how do you bring to life the reality of that history that what seems now what the whole world thinks is enmity was once friendship and because of it the world was better uh what what better way to bring these realities to life than through stories definitely um yeah you gotta bring history to life and and make it relatable for people well thank you to everyone i want to thank uh, our panelists uh, alina tessa dora and richard I apologize we had for you know some technical difficulties, but I think we still were able to have a really good uh, discussion. Uh, congratulations on your books, and thanks again, everyone who attended, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you.